Dr. Lisa Jones Christensen is an assistant professor of organizational behavior and human resources in the Marriott School of Business. She earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Organizational Behavior from the University of California, Berkeley, a Master's of Arts in International Development from BYU, a Master's of Business Administration from the Marriott School of Management at BYU, and a PhD in Organizational Behavior from the University of North Carolina. Her most recent publication is titled Inducing Corporate Social Responsibility, Should Investors Reward the Responsible or Punish the Irresponsible, in the forthcoming 2021 volume of Journal of Business Ethics. She received the Best Paper Award, Award for her dissertation on change management, the Innovation and Entrepreneurship Pedagogy Award, and many other notable awards and publications. Dr. Jones Christensen is particularly interested in connecting with students who may feel out of place at BYU and contributing to a more aware and understanding perspective on campus. Her current interests involve research on women entrepreneurs and their access to microcredit, looking at the trends that women experience in the interim step between entrepreneurial ideas and the actual pitch. Catherine Glad from Boise, Idaho, is an undergraduate student studying statistics at BYU. She originally was introduced to women's stats research after TAing for Professor Nielsen's Stat 121 course. As a research assistant, she is involved in the quantitative side of research that is focused on women entrepreneurs. After graduation, she plans to attend graduate school and work with the experimental design and analysis of clinical trials for new medications. She originally wasn't aware of the experiences of women entrepreneurs, as many of us may be, but after being exposed to that field of research, she has become passionate about research centered on women's experiences. Both Dr. Jones, and Christians, uh, Dr. Jones Christensen and Catherine are strong advocates for change and larger acknowledgement of women's experiences, especially in sectors that lack equal representation. The title of this colloquium presentation is Female Entrepreneurs, Family Embeddedness, and Legitimacy, Legitimacy Thresholds. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Lisa Jones Christensen and Catherine Glad. I think we need to stand here for the audio. I'm so happy to be with you. And um, every piece of communication that has come about this started with GWS. And I just wanted to tell you what wasn't in the intro is that I have dedicated my life, my dissertation and my academic life to using um, business principles to fight global poverty. So I love the G, I love women, I like myself on good days, So I, uh, and I love studying, uh, obviously I've dedicated my life to that. So I'm so happy to be with um, just a, a very important um, part of our research. I'm happy to be with Catherine to tell you what we are learning. And I mentioned to a few people I talked to casually that uh, this, is, this is not fully baked research. This is research in process. And so we invite you into understanding, uh, into the messiness and into like the not fully baked findings. Well, these are preliminary. Now that said, our time here, in a way you get two speakers and I think two, two jumbo takeaways. So uh, the journey of how we got to the work that Catherine is doing, the work that um, puts me uh, in community with the other speakers you've had, in some ways, let's just be honest, it's because we all received a grant to fund our research. We got the same grant and we're all in different places with that. But before we went for the grant, there's a story to tell. And that's where I will begin and Catherine will run cleanup and tell you about the in-process work. Does that make sense? So the first takeaway, uh, the first thing we wanna talk about is this. So I already told you that my colleague Ari, who isn't here, she's at Syracuse. She and I have spent decades working in developing countries, um, particularly with women on that in that boundary, in the informal economy, women in such deep poverty that they may or may not choose to make their business legal. So we work with women crossing boundaries or choosing not to cross boundaries. Um, and uh, then we have day jobs uh, where we also teach just, let's call them uh, fully developed country entrepreneurs um, in a business school. And we teach kind of standard best practices in how to be open and start and run and grow businesses. And so we teach something you've probably heard. It's common. Um, it's in the vernacular that the first place you seek funding are usually from friends, family, or perhaps fools, right? We usually just say friends and family. 
And um, that advice is research backed. It's also historically true. And um, and just reading from the from the slide, you'll see that the reason we say this in scholarly terms, it's obvious too, are that anyone starting something new has to overcome the liability of newness. And the best way to do that is not just literally money and labor, often free labor. It's actually when someone does that with you and for you, it begins that process of legitimizing you, right? So legitimacy, when things feel like this is allowed to be here, then other people join and follow. So this search for legitimacy is a huge part of entrepreneurship. Does this person supporting me finally make me for real? Have I finally arrived? That's legitimacy. And the more that you're seen as legitimate, the more resources you get. And often because I'm in a business school, we talk about money, but but we're all aware of the uh, non-financial resources we need. We need support and, um, and other things. So, um, so if we give this advice, my however, and it might be, I hope that it hurts how obvious this feels when you hear it. I hope that you are as shocked as our readers have been, our friendly reviewers. The, the, before we get to the research that we got a grant, we started to write this paper. We found that women um, entrepreneurs, they're being studied kind of uh, pretty far. If, if my hand waving here represents the journey from having an idea um, beginning to seek support. We study women entrepreneurs after they're sort of so fully baked that they're asking for formal money. And you may have heard that a lot of news coverage came for um, uh, men who are making pitches for their ventures are often asked um, uh, about growth and women pitching ventures are often asked about how they're going to mitigate risk. And, and so there's, the, there's great studies and new information about some of the unfairness you're very attuned to that happens once um, a man and a woman might be pitching. We also study how likely are women to continue to grow their businesses. What kind of funding do they seek? We're sort of deeply obsessed after they've emerged and have started to ask primarily for money or customers. And so uh, what occurred to Ari and I before we met Catherine was to say, this is scary. We aren't going backwards to looking at how embedded are women, what even stops them from, from getting that far or what, let's be positive. What are some things that women entrepreneurs have going for them that enable them to get to that space, to be asked different questions. We said this research starts kind of too late. We want to know. And because we met so many women who they were so inseparable from their stories, from their children, from their poverty, from their community. We thought this is too sterile. We need to go to the messy earlier part. So, so that led to our research question. And uh, that is, um, is there a family threshold? So I don't think I was clear about what I said to shock you. Um, men, uh, ent male entrepreneurs can usually assume family support. It is not questioned. There is no advice in business schools about how to pitch to your, to your parents, to your spouse, how to, um, there's just nothing because it's just assumed that it will happen. Every scholar in family business we've shown our idea to, every scholar in entrepreneurship, as soon as they read it, like this is really obvious and really embarrassing. And understandable in a historical context, that's, that's what you've been studying your whole majors and minors. I won't go into that. But I will say that, that it is the most simple paper in the world and still shocking that we basically said, can, we, can women assume the same level of support? Can they assume that their spouse will work for free for their business? Can they assume that they can use or uh, family money without... Uh, asking anyone? And can we assume that they can use it as long as they want? So these are the research questions. Is there a familial threshold, probably for men and women, but it's not even been asked. Can we use a gender lens to really understand that threshold? Uh, and again, we believe it needs to be looked at for men or the second son or um, someone with different needs or different types of families, right? So the question is not just a women's question. We're just using a gendered lens to break open and really illustrate this threshold. And so we think that we also need to answer the question, why would a family grant or not grant a woman or a, a, an entrepreneur access to legitimacy? Because from legitimacy, flows all those resources. So this is legitimacy. It's basically just means that you're considered, I mean, I guess we use the word in, in, um, 
colloquially, is are we legit? Are we um, considered viable? And there are types of legitimacy, cognitive, moral, um, lots of different kinds. Of, that's not the best use of our time. But you can buy the idea that women may need to do more to be considered legitimate. And they may need to start that search and quest in their own families. Um, this is a lot of fine print to show that we're scholars and we are citing other people, but it bottom line just says for us, and you may, this might be interesting to you. We let the women define family. It is not, a, it is not, um, uh, it could be a self-defined unit of those who create an identity. And I think you might find that interesting. It's not just a biological fact. It is, um, there's some changing logic and thoughts about what, de what uh, defines family. If you move past that, then what you will also see is what probably feels very natural to you in this audience. And that is every family has different expectations about child care, caregiving responsibilities, protection of property from outsiders, um, social roles in the family. But I, I'll just share two hypotheses and that led to this next. Um, so I went too fast. We have one proposition that is you seek, what am I doing wrong? There you go. This is the first one. Just that family embedded, because some entrepreneurs perhaps are not, family embedded nascent entrepreneurs um, will seek legitimacy from the family before, you know, we talk to you with my arm waving before they go to other stakeholders, venture capitalists and others. So we first need to establish and give this gift to the scholarly community that, hey, pay attention and ask the question of what women and men go through in a family. And then let's use a gender lens to really show you what people might be going through. So we think first there's a timing and process issue. I have more propositions, we're only gonna do two. The second one we have is that a family does grant a female entrepreneur um, legitimacy and all of its benefits only to the degree that she adheres to that family's norms. So, um, uh, due to the historic and patriarchal demarcations that you've been learning about for your whole time in this major and minor, you know why that might be, but we have to illustrate that. We've had some, some editors say to us, like this, we don't see it. Like, so we really had to show some people, uh, almost a generation of scholars, um, the, the basic kind of gender 101. We have to write it in the paper without insulting them. So that is the, our theory paper. And, um, and you might not be surprised. I, this one I, I wish were surprising, but um, the literature that we're starting to show our editors uh, is that what I already said to you, um, that historically and scholars have established empirically that women uh, are expected to help male spouses in a cis-normative gender, like, that kind of couple um, and that it's not uh, reciprocated for women. So we told you that the theory paper got great response. Like, what? This needs to be said. This is, a, this is going to change family business literature, entrepreneurship literature, and uh, we'll get to the other implications later. Catherine has some great points about that. But then we said, we need some money to see if this is true. A theory paper you can write without data, right? But we needed to see what is the messy beginning? What will women admit? What do women know? What questions can we ask so that women will be more revealed to themselves? Um, so are they getting time, money, and support? Um, are they enabled to grow? And as I said before, what helps them grow and what hinders their growth? And that's where... We, as I said, already wrote the theory paper, but our grant request was to study women across the US. We think there will be an interesting um, subset of pressures uh, on LDS women. And I think I'd like to write that from within BYU in a, in a careful way, but we also didn't want it to be a Mormon women paper. We have enough to say about women before we move to the subset of LDS women. So we wanted a representative sample across the country about the uh, entire context and that we call that the embedded nature of the journey. And so our grant request it was to study women founders across the US, as I just said, um, to report to the, to answer our questions. And we will speak, are they even aware of the patriarchal system that they live in? That's not the language we use. It's appropriate here, but it's not appropriate in our survey. So, um, what happened is we asked for the money to do this, and then we spent the money on some fabulous grad students. And one of them is Catherine, who knows so much about the data. So will you come tell them about what we are, what we found in the messy middle? 
Awesome. I'm really excited to tell you kind of my side of the story. Lisa gave you all the background and now um, I'm more involved with the current side of the project, um, which is interviews we're having. Um, so first of all, let's talk about our initial goals um, in this research. Our goals are to have 200 interviews from a wide variety of size of businesses um, across the country. And basically we're trying to hear these entrepreneur stories. We're trying to get um, the information from our direct sources, right? These women who have um, gone through the process of creating their own business. And we're trying to find those common um, trends specifically in the early stage development um, of their businesses. So this is our current protocol. There are seven sections. Um, and these are just the questions that we ask um, these entrepreneurs about. So first we ask about their business background. Um, we ask what kind of business they have, um, why they started that business, um, all, the, all the behind the scenes, things like that. And then we get into the early stages, which has a lot to do with the um, familial thresholds um, that um, were discussed earlier. We talk about how involved they are with their, their family involvement, um, what kind of support they get from them. And then on the flip side, we also talk about what kind of pushback they receive um, in the form of naysayers. Um, we then ask them about early stage dynamics, such as how this business is affecting their household and vice versa, how their household um, affects their business. And then we discuss work-life management, growth and scale, develop, um, demographics. And then another section that I think is really interesting is their identity as a female and how they feel um, that that impacts the way they approach business. So here are just um, some of our basic sampling methods we've used to obtain um, the samples that we have so far. So there's a lot of female entrepreneur databases out there, and we've used those to collect um, contact information for a lot of these women who have founded their businesses. And um, we sent out a lot of cold call emails, and then LinkedIn messages have actually been really um, helpful for helping us reach out to these women. And they've been really responsive through that platform, which I think is really interesting. Um, finally, we have snowball sampling, which has been um, actually crucial to our study so far. Uh, once we interview those women at the end, once we've established that trust with them, um, we ask if they know of any friends or anyone else who might fit our criteria um, for the research and if they might be interested in that. And we've had a lot of success um, from that snowball sampling. We've had lots of referrals that way, which has been really awesome. So currently we have Obviously, we're still in the middle of this research, um, but we currently have 89 interviews completed. Um, we have a wide variety of business sizes, business types, and locations all throughout the US. Um, we have 13 states and actually five countries as well. Um, so our research has kind of gotten out, gotten out there. Um, a large proportion of the women we have interviewed have their businesses in either Utah or California. Um, currently, We've kind of paused interviews and we're reevaluating our protocol and trying to um, decide if we need to change some of the questions or add some questions um, that we initially didn't think of. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. And we're also currently looking for more female entrepreneurs to interview. So if any of you um, know people who have started their own businesses um, and would be interested in our research, um, we'll have our information up at the end of this slide and we'd love for you to reach out and um, let us know about them and we will totally get them involved. Um, here are a couple of the questions, um, the specific questions in our protocol that have been um, more generative um, and we've gotten some really interesting answers from. And we'll talk um, more about specifics of some of these questions later. Um, so we asked, what was the spark that started you on this journey? Um, what role do you feel like others' expectations of you have had? How is your identity as a female? impacted how you approach your business? And then do you think the experience of being an entrepreneur would differ if you were male instead of a female? And we'll get more quotes on these um, directly from the interviews later. A Couple common themes we've noticed so far, just in our preliminary examination of our data. And um, we found some trends in motivation behind why these women are starting their businesses. Um, and I think that's super interesting. So I'll go more in depth with that in the next couple of slides. We've also seen struggles with funding. And as a result of that, um, the majority of these women have bootstrapped their companies, um, which I have a lot of respect for. <clears throat> Finally, we see 
a lot of naysayers and a lot of lack of perceived legitimacy from others, um, specifically in the form of these women's parents. Um, that's been a common theme. So let's talk about the motivations um, a little bit. I categorize these into three different groups and I'll provide specific examples um, of women that we've interviewed. And these are just a few of the examples, but almost every single interview fits into one of these three categories. So first of all, we have flexibility or necessity. Um, this one's important because a lot of these women have children um, or other demands on their time. So sometimes the, the normal eight to five job just doesn't work for them, or sometimes they need some extra flex money for those children. So for example, um, one woman founded a cake business in Utah. Um, and the reason she did this was because she needed to be home. She needed to be able to take her kids to their sports activities. She needed to help them with their homework. Um, and she just wanted to be home with them when they were home. Um, she also needed a little bit of extra money on the side to be able to afford those things for her children. And so this coming up with her business was her solution to those problems. And it granted her the flexibility and that extra money that she needed. Um, in addition, we have multiple photography businesses we've talked to that have given us the same kind of reason for starting that business, um, being um, they need specific hours. Maybe they can do photography sessions at night when their husband comes home to take care of the kids, um, things like that. Another hair company in Utah also provided the same reasons. Um, the next kind of general motivation that we saw was these women observed a gap in a product or a service um, in an in industry, and they decided they were going to fill that gap. So one that I interviewed, and I thought this interview was really fascinating. Um, this woman was a doctor. She'd been a doctor for many years. Um, she was very successful in her field, making a lot of money. But she saw um, that people, particularly the poor and the elderly, having a really hard time accessing healthcare, either because their doctors were booked out for so long or because they couldn't physically make it to the location of the doctor's office. Um, a lot of them didn't have cars. A lot of them were very poor um, and they just couldn't do it. And so she said, okay, I'm going to find a solution to this problem. And so she came up with a telemedicine company where they take a two-pronged approach. Um, they will take home calls and they'll drive out to the patients and go see them in their own homes, or they'll drop off um, a tablet that they can use virtual appointments with. And so I thought that was a really cool way of addressing this need. Um, consulting businesses, a lot of women, um, I think we had three interviews about consulting businesses that women started. And they said a similar thing. They said, we just, we were having a hard time in our own lives um, finding opportunities like this. And so we want to help other people. We want to make this on the market and we want to make, make it available to more people. The last motivation that was a really common one, probably the most common, um, was a lift problem. So a lot of these women <clears throat> um, ran into some problem in their own life and, and it kind of bothered them that there wasn't a good solution out there. So they went and made their own solution. Um, two women I talked to, both created their own publishing company. And they, the reason for doing that was because there currently were no existing publishing companies that would publish their books. Um, they said a, lar a large reason of it might have been that they were both women. And um, typically, publishing companies um, have a harder time publishing women's books. Um, so they said, okay, we're going to go create our own companies so that other women don't have the same problem. We're going to make sure their voice is heard and uh, make sure they have access to publishing. Um, another interesting interview um, was this woman who started a baby products company. She said, um, all the baby carriers and everything are just so awkward and it just drives me crazy. So I'm gonna create my own baby wrap. And so she did and she became majorly successful from that. And um, we see a couple more examples, uh, meditation apps. There were two women we interviewed who started their own meditation companies and apps um, because their children were having really hard times um, with, with stress and dealing with all of that. And the current products on the market just did not work for their children. So they went out and made their own apps. Um, so we see these three common trends among the women. And I think the motivations are really interesting.
Um, the next couple of slides are going to be some of the responses we received from a few questions near the end of our protocol about female identity um, in entrepreneurship and how, how they viewed being a female entrepreneur. So I'm just going to read um, this one. We asked if they had any final thoughts on being a female entrepreneur. And we're keeping all of these anonymous um, for the sake of the research. All of the women's answers were completely anonymized. Um, but this did come straight from their interviews. So she said, I want to say that it was harder to start out being a woman. I think I was more afraid to actually get out there and do that as a woman than I would have been as a man. And that I probably would have started sooner if I weren't a woman. So that's that's an interesting theme. And throughout these next couple of quotes, you'll see a couple other themes as well. And I want you to try and pick those out. Um, this one, this woman was really fun. Um, we asked her, um, do you think the experience would differ if you were a male instead of a female? And she was very adamant about this. She said, yes, a million times over. Um, if I were male, I would be the president. Um, I might still be the president as a woman, but I'm, I would already have been the president if I were a male. Um, and she goes on to explain how women are their own critics and we're really self-critical and it can sometimes hold us back in fields like entrepreneurship. Um, when asked the same question, um, another person replied, I think men are more accepted in that world still, even though, I mean, we've come a long way. We're making progress, right? Um, but she still thinks that men are more, have a different kind of respect than women do. This next one represents kind of a different, um, a different category of responses that we received from this question. She says, I'm sure it, it's had a massive impact on everything from you know, my personal fortitude to the experiences and challenges I bring to the table to ability to raise capital. But honestly, I think of myself as a woman and as a CEO, but not as a woman CEO. So I want you to just think about that one for a minute. Cool. And then, and then final thoughts. Um, one person said, yes, I have a lot of thoughts. I've seen hurdles and I've also seen being empowered because I was a female entrepreneur. And I think that's really powerful. Um, something that everyone said was, yes, there are definitely differences between being a male and female entrepreneur, but I, I would not give it up. I love having this identity. So now um, I'm going to transition into talking about the qualitative research aspect um, of this whole project and some of its pros and some of its cons. Um, qualitative research is definitely inherently more difficult than quantitative research in a lot of ways. Um, I'm very familiar with quantitative research and that's kind of my thing. I love numbers. I love means. I love proportions and counts and anything that we can perform those statistical analyses on. Um, my background as a statistics student kind of has bred that into me. Okay, numbers, numbers, numbers. Those are really important. Um, but when we're doing qualitative, we don't always get those numbers. And it can be a little bit frustrating at times um, just because it's hard to interpret. It's hard to analyze. Um, and it's just more difficult than quantitative research. Um, but it's definitely very rewarding. And it, it targets different things. So our quantitative research is definitely targeting the experiences of these women. Um, and we're able to learn a lot about that from this qualitative research. Okay, so this is just a couple, a couple of the downsides of qualitative research that make it more difficult to work with. Um, we know it doesn't always give the desired results. Sometimes your questions don't, um, aren't interpreted the way that you think they're going to be. Um, and sometimes, they just answer a completely different question, and that can be difficult. Um, in addition, you have to worry about bias in a lot of ways. Um, so your question wording, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, as well as your response um, to the participants as an interviewer, you have to be very aware of the effect that you might be having on, um, on their answers to these questions. So one of the, this is just an example of one of the questions in our current protocol that we're kind of having to revise a little bit because we've seen some mixed answers here. So our question was, 
um, when did you start your business? Right. And that seems like a fairly, I mean, fairly straightforward question. It seemed like a pretty simple question to me at first. Um, but then we found these women um, interpreted that in so many ways. And I didn't even think about that at first, but it was whether or not like um, they became like the first product they sold or when they were officially recognized as a business. Um, there's just so many different benchmarks for that measurement. And so that's an example of something that we're kind of reworking a little bit. And when we start up our next round of interviews, um, we're going to be more aware of that in the future. And that's one of the fun things with qualitative research is we get to re reevaluate and, um, and learn about our mistakes. So I'm going to end with just the implications of some of the research we've been doing, and then I'll let um, Dr. Jones Christensen kind of close us off with some remarks. Um, but in general, um, we've seen a lot of support from husbands and partners, um, but a lack of support from the parents, which is very interesting um, because as was discussed earlier, we know that family um, familial thresholds are really important and they need that sense of legitimacy from their families. Um, and in that order is really important. They need their family legitimacy first. Um, so it's really interesting that their parents were often the biggest naysayers. Um, in their interviews, people, um, these women would often respond like, yeah, when I presented this idea to my dad or my mom, they said, okay, why would you do that? You're not going to make any money from that. Or you already have a good job. Why are you going to switch to that? Um, and they said their parents brought up a lot of good points, but sometimes it was kind of discouraging. Um, I think it's great that they're getting support from their um, husbands and partners, though. I think that's really important. Um, in the STEM field, um, we saw um, years ago, right, we saw not very many women were going into the STEM fields. And so there, was, there were questions like, how can we combat this? And they decided to target STEM to more of a K through 12 audience um, instead of targeting it right when they get to, right when women get to college, right? And they found that targeting at a younger age like this can actually help um, increase the amount of women who go into STEM. And so we're proposing kind of a similar thing for this context. Um, we need to start encouraging this at a younger age and supporting these women's ideas at a younger age. Um, a lot of times people want to provide more funding for women, but this actually might be too late because they still need that sense of legitimacy. Um, finally, different motives. We talk, talked about that a little bit earlier, require different types of support. So we talked about kind of the three categories of motivation that I had, the flexibility and necessity, um, as well as um, the lack of products um, and filling a gap. And each of those motives require different kinds of support. Um, a lot of times um, for the women who just need flexibility, um, that may require different um, things than a woman who's trying to fill a gap in the market. So we need to just be aware of that um, and really help these women feel validated and like their ideas are really strong and are needed. Because if we, if we don't do this, we're going to miss out on so many important products and services that wouldn't be out there otherwise. I love that you got exposed to her um, uh, dissonance, cognitive dissonance as she went from that love of uh, statistics to the world of qualitative research. A few things that I was thinking about as we were speaking that maybe we haven't made clear that might be the right things to say as we wait for your questions and close up. Uh, one thing is we did... Um, limit the data and the type of businesses. And I'm not sure we showed you that. So we uh, did not want to talk to people doing multi-level marketing or um, uh, network businesses as they're called uh, for now. That is a whole separate kind of decision. And that, those people tend to be in that flexibility um, category. For now, we didn't want to muddy that. We also were trying to get such a wide sample that we didn't want to oversample on um, in-home services like hair, hair, hair dressing, uh, and other kind of the, in the beauty industry. So we have very minimal of, of that. Um, we have a couple of other theories and we call them, we were talking about it in terms of papers, 
But we also wanted to get a group of women who are using technology, who are believing that it might be freeing for them. And we think there might be a double-edged sword that something uh, believing, oh, I can work from home. Many um, want that perceived flexibility, but sometimes they're being a slave to technology. And this idea that technology is enabling them, it's actually uh, causing them to pay less attention to what they thought they were going to serve. Um, less attention uh, to the day-to-day -day life and more to a virtual life. And so we have some theories and we're able to test that with this many responses. Those are a few things that I think we had made clear. Um, we uh, are just ready for your thoughts, your summaries, your questions, and, um, and we're grateful for your time. So is this where we stop? Okay. Dr. Jones Christensen and Catherine Glad's work stems from the need to understand the embedded nature of female entrepreneurship, which means exploring how context affects venture decision making. Specifically, their research investigates the idea of a family legitimacy threshold for new ventures and tackles the question of when and why a family grants or does not grant resources to a female led venture. As women begin their journey as entrepreneurs, they enter a competitive male dominated world where they will experience different forms of support and roadblocks than their male counterparts. It's essential to understand how women, women's experiences differ from men's as they embark on this journey, because an understanding of the challenges that women face, as well as the factors that enable them to succeed, will allow us to provide more support for these women and shift any cultural perceptions or biases we may have that may be inadvertently limiting the potential of female entrepreneurs. And to a certain extent, the challenges that women entrepreneurs face are as universal as entrepreneurship itself. Cultural norms and perceptions regarding women's place in the family and in business play a role in how women go about starting a business, whether they live in Silicon Valley or a rural village in a developing country. Since female entrepreneurs form such a diverse group, hearing their stories is really the only way to fully understand what these women are experiencing. Dr. Jones Christensen's research gives us a glimpse into these women's lives, struggles, and successes, giving us a clear view of what can be done to give these women the same chance for success in entrepreneurship as their male counterparts. Empowering female entrepreneurs to succeed is, is an extremely impactful way to increase equality for women worldwide, as it allows women to take their career and their path in life into their own hands. As we consider the stories and experiences of female entrepreneurs, we should reflect on what we can do to shape the culture of the communities we live in to give female entrepreneurs the greatest possible chance of success. And we'll now turn the time over to Linda for our Q&A. All right, so we are now starting the Q&A portion of our presentation today. And so I will start with the first question, but if you want to line up over here, um, social distance, keep it safe. Um, you can ask any questions and Meg will be taking questions from online. So submit your questions in the Zoom chat. And so my question was, you both of you kind of touched on how family structures tend to affect women in pursuing business endeavors. And I was curious on how do gender structures impact the kinds of business endeavors women tend to undertake? No, no, no. <laughs> If I understood the question correctly, you said, how do gender structures affect the choice of the business? Like their motive. And you heard me in some ways allude to that by saying we had some uh, preconceived notions that there might be um, uh, a, a gendering of uh, just like, uh, what, is, what is it? There's a, there's a flippant term for like beauty. It's like three B's or something. Um, but you get what I'm saying. It looks like from you nodding that there is um, an assumption that women are guided or is considered more legitimate. Like, oh, I don't see you being starting a telemedicine company, but you can, you know, cut hair in our basement, right? That there, and we do see that. Um, and we are going to study that, like what, um, and, but we need to tie that and make it correlated. None of us are surprised it might happen in some families, but we need to see, um, you know, locations of the country, background of the, of the parents and the partners. We need to see, 
um, you know, can women co-opt what is maybe used against them to be considered it's safe to go in those businesses and make them really big. A lot of the women that we met may, are multimillionaires off of uh, the baby carriers. A lot of them are family oriented, but not all. The, the, the eczema lotions that they discovered for serving the people that they love. Um, so if money is one form of legitimacy, which it is, then multi-millions, at least in the building I work in, are considered to be um, a sign of arrival, right? So sometimes these women have used, uh, kind of reversed the, the things that were weaponized against them, like you're only allowed in these fields. I'm like, all right, and I'll just make some millions of dollars. What is interesting too on the gender lens is that sometimes, and I find this so interesting and personally, um, I don't know what I think about it uh, in, at the individual level, but a lot of them want to retire their husbands because if we are talking cis-normative uh, and heterosexual marriages, these are women married to men and they want to like, uh, they find one final sense of empowerment is retiring their husbands is a phrase they use. And that's either a definition in their own world of success. And, um, and then when, if we think what many of us believe about like work being an eternal principle and ending someone's work, I just find that find that just a fascinating other topic we can go into, but that's a gendered thing. Like, is that the ultimate in empowerment to switch it in your family? I don't know. My family's already switched up. So, um, so I share, is that like the kind of tangent you want to go on? Like I, uh, I can keep going, but if like, there are other questions and we have a, I'll stay here, but Catherine, did you have anything to add? I want to make sure that like, besides just undermining, we have uh, sexism in the world. We also could have like ageism or studentism where like I silent her voice when she knows a ton about the data. Oh, no, no, that was super great. That's almost okay. exactly what I was going to say. Like, um, women do, I mean, some of the women we've interviewed have tended um, to go into these, like the baby career, right? Like a man probably wouldn't think about like a nap for a baby, but she went off and made millions of dollars off of that. And I think that's awesome. No, that's obviously not all of them. There are a lot of women who took um, more technology-based um, companies, and it's really awesome. <laughs> Gender in a corner, right? That we are also looking at women who have scaled technology ventures, and they have to have scaled and employ lots of people. And so we really have, with 200 interviews, you can you can publish a paper with 35, right? So we can do a lot of different themes, and. Um, maybe I'll come back to that because it's like the whole point of it. So go ahead. So, um, I know that you said that one of the motivations for starting a business was to have flexibility. And I'm curious, like, for the women, that, that was, was it necessarily the motivation? Insights on childcare? Or, you know, like, how do we balance to that and, like, what are the emotions surrounding that? Um, so from what I, what I experienced in the interviews, at least, um, the women who weren't necessarily going for flexibility, um, previously, they had already been working um, jobs that were, you know, normally eight to five jobs or whatever, and they had their children um, in daycare or they hired um, someone to take care of the children for them. Um, and so that was just kind of their norm. They were already used to that. Um, and so, so that's what I found in my, in my interviews. So because we have so many and the difficulty will be in deciding where those cutoffs are and can we stand behind them? Would other researchers agree with our decisions of how to divide the data? But, and I do think that there's even some selection bias and who I spoke to as a principal investigator versus who, um, what leads we gave to RAs and TAs, there's probably some meaning. I guess that's a long way of saying some of the women I talked to, that's all we talked about as, um, as uh, and I talked to women who had reached a different level of either material success or uh, size of company, whether they chose to not have but that they didn't value money. We still, I think we kind of reserve for the PIs, some of our, like what we thought were our, you know, best uh, in, in some categories. And so I want to make sure I got your question right. Did they talk about the challenge of having children? How, what was the level of emotion, emotionality around that? And was there a third aspect to your question? Like if they, if you found that they had things that we wanted to do. Yes. Yeah. 
because that's the question I get asked the most as a female faculty. It's the question that, you know, dominates literature. I mean, some people won't even take the word work-life balance anymore. We call it work-life, I don't know, just life. This is work and life. I don't know. But we're working on the terminology because there's so much unrest and interest in that. So I talked to some women who also, let's be honest, let's talk the whole range. Some had massive flexibility to take care of their children and to do children-oriented products. Other women felt like pursuing this business probably cost them their marriage. We need to talk about the full like spectrum or, and it could have been how they handled it. It could have been the nature of a partner, that partner and that marriage may have, I mean, a lot of our questions, no one can know what it would like to be a man. I wanted to clarify that we asked that in some ways to reveal, are they aware of the patriarchal systems within, within which they're working? Do they um, use any of that language in their conversation? And are they open to us expanding some questions? So you may be wondering, why would you ask a question like that when a finding would be, let's, you can work with that finding, but it's an open, it's a way to open a door in a, in a lay person way. Am I making sense? So did we leave anything out? Yeah. And um, one last thing, there was a lot of like mom guilt um, that we have found in these interviews. I, yeah, <laughs> um, they, they just felt bad that they couldn't always be with their children. But one way we found that a lot of women were, were trying to kind of um, compensate for that was by um, setting really firm boundaries between, okay, when I'm home, I am not going to be I'm checking my email with work. I'm not going to be doing anything else related to that. I'm just going to be focusing on my children. And that that worked for a lot of them. And yeah, so those boundaries will be some of the interesting findings. Like one woman built a massively uh, in corporate in, in inside corporation medical practice. And she said, I would only build it after my kids were asleep. So these kind of limitations, but we think we can find when we can aggregate this is what is the world missing when we hold women to start at 9 p.m. at night? What is the world missing? How soon could all those people who are like health is improved inside their companies be served? If that's like, we're looking at an economics paper to like the cost of this, but we have to be fair. What is the cost of two families or children? Um, but I will also say a lot of women felt like, um, I think we're using the word emancipated by their newfound economic freedom, their newfound political freedom in the, in the dyad, the, the couple their, that they showed their children, you can do things, you can follow dreams. So you can compensate or alter mom guilt with like mom, like dynamism, right? My mom is a baller. Is that allowed to be said in like a scholarly way? Yeah. Yeah. So class time is up. So if anyone needs to go, you can leave, but we're going to stay behind and just take a little more questions from the chat too. I was trying to give you a lot of social distance, but now. Okay, bye guys. Thank you. Okay, so our first question from the chat is from Augustine Larson, and she wants to know, you mentioned that bootstrapping was a common theme um, among participants. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, sorry. I thought that when we were using, we have our business school terms. You probably can guess, and she probably, our questioner probably could, but it is a, a term referring to financing it herself, whether that's from what we call even hidden money, siphoned off from some women have allowances. Some women are like, oh, that's your business. You can use your business, anything you make, whether it's starting telemedicine or selling, um, you know, tubby Todd uh, lotions, uh, you can keep that money for yourself. So that's bootstrapping where she finances for herself, but not asking, can we use family money, retirement plans? Can we go tap into the inheritance? That's when you step outside of bootstrapping into like formal funding requests and anything to add. Like, um, so, great question. What kind of are more commonly asked to women that aren't asked to men when they apply for a loan? Well, for a loan, not just for starting a business. Um, I can only speak personally that when I went to like refinance my house, they wanted to know, um, they wanted, like they kept wanting to put my husband's name on it. I'm like, he has like none of the money, uh, None of the, like, we had a lot of reasons that I'm happy to talk about. And he's happy to talk about of why this asset was in my name and he didn't need to come to the bank with me in 2021 in, in America. So um, the assumption that I either didn't have his support or that I, 
uh, needed it or that like, did I want him to be there with me to sign a paper <laughs> and um, was stunning to me. So that is at a personal level. Again, I probably, we can't speak at a research level to the loan question, but women, yeah, maybe that's it alone for business. Or even I think earlier, like, is this idea viable women often men have to pitch. I'm not staring at you, even though you're just the, the vehicle women and men obviously have to pitch an idea and a business plan. And men are, women are historically asked about risk mitigation. I think I hinted that at the beginning and men are asked about their growth plans. Like, how will you make this big? How will you scale? And women are asked, like, how will you make sure you don't lose this money if we give it to you? And that's a whole different question. Both should be asked both, right? Like, we should, no one should lose it. And everyone should grow it if that's the plan. And so that has been, like, a hugely uh, validated, uh, replicated research finding. Women are also asked, like, how can you manage it? Like, why? And as we say, there's lots of jokes. No one says, why is it called babysitting when a man does it? And, and there's, like, raising your children when a woman does it. Are you supposed to say thank you for like, so there's lots of questions about balance that women are asked um, that men are not. Alex Marshall, what does encouraging entrepreneurship at a younger age look like? Would this be in school programs? So I think um, a lot of kind of what we were focusing on is the family's specific role in that, um, especially when the children are younger. Um, <clears throat> I think when girls and women are taught from a young age, like, yes, we, we want to support your ideas and we want you to go and live these dreams. You know, I think um, that can be really powerful, especially in those formative years of their lives. Um, is it okay if I answer that with something I've been wanting to say the whole time, which is I forgot one of the implications. One might be that K through 12 analogy, like we need to start earlier and that's the spirit of the question. And we might need to go to retirement homes and businesses and talk to parents. And like what it means is if you want to help women entrepreneurs, everyone else is just opening checkbooks. Melinda Gates wants to help women entrepreneurs and she's trying to have more funding. Our research suggests maybe you need to talk to a whole bunch of parents, a whole generation of parents who might benefit from learning how the world could benefit if they would say yes to their middle-aged daughters, adult daughters, right? Um, 20 something daughters. So some of it might be, we need to go to a whole bunch of retirement homes and get messages. And the other might be, what does it mean in K through 12? One of the best things I heard from the founder of Spanx, whether you, however you feel about Shapewear, she's just been purchased uh, for multi billions of dollars and feels that she built a business she could be okay with. But that company, Asera, the founder says her father every day growing up said, how did you fail today? He normalized failure for women instead of stay in line and be really good and don't mess up and don't color out the lines. How did you color out the lines? How did you fail? What did you learn from it? Bring me another failure tomorrow. That can't be scaled at every home. We need to look at a lot of things and what family dynamics are, but that's a, a very um, specific answer to like, what do we do earlier? We can start without trying to force a lot of, of change of some kind that many people are comfortable with. But some, that's pretty minor to just make it okay, but it's also major. Sorry, I don't know if it was just the chat questions, but um, you talked about how not following family norms also has an impact on establishing legitimacy. So I was wondering if you could go into more like how women or other identities have problems with going to their families with this when they don't follow the norms of them, I guess. Could I ask you to clarify the question? I bet you're, you're thinking, do you have a working theory of your own, like what, what you think we might say? I think you're interesting. <laughs> so, well, um, I think maybe if they wanted to go outside of the box and do something that targets an audience that their parents might not entirely feel comfortable with, it would be hard to ask them for money or support when they need it. That's exactly what our foundational premise was. And I love the way that you used your words carefully. I think that's so important. Um, we believe an implication in the theory paper, not even yet the, the unborn empirical paper, is this probably happens for anyone who's non basically, can we just get it's like off limits time or in free, like non middle class white male, right? What if you are um, transgender? What if you are um, same sex attracted? What if in some way you are violating a family norm, if that family isn't accepting of those things, if you're violating a family norm, 
then you're going to face the same thing in this paper that we use a gender lens to show. You're going to have to ask differently. You're going to have to, um, you know, go in fear versus assumption of, 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 of primacy and acceptance. You're going to pitch carefully. You're going to wait longer before you, you ask someone you're going to hide money and build it as far as you can. And before you ask, you're going to go to friends and go outside of family. There's going to be costs. All of this to me is economics. There'll be a cost to, um, to that delay and the work you do to drive across town to talk about it at your friend's house. Like, um, so I love the language and the care you took because we're just using a gendered lens to say, maybe the second son, let's just keep it white males. Maybe the second son, maybe it all got used up on the first one, but there is probably a family threshold. And because of the biology right now where women bear children, we think the children factor matters. We aren't talking only to women who didn't have children. We're talking to women who do and don't. call it? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for everyone's participation today. We're so grateful for Dr. Christensen and Catherine for joining us. And we're going to close the Q&A and we're going to close the presentation for today. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.